So, hello. My name is Peter Fisher. I'm a professor here at MIT, and this is the Blossoms module on galaxies and dark matter. And in the next hour, we're going to talk about uh, what a galaxy is and uh, a little bit about how it works. And then we're going to talk about how, in order to understand how a galaxy works, we need to introduce a new form of matter, which is called dark matter. And dark matter is one of the most pressing issues for physicists today because we really don't have any idea of what dark matter is. We'll talk a little bit towards the end about dark matter's properties, but really the main message is that the shape of our galaxy is really determined by the presence of dark matter. So many of you probably know that galaxies are large collections of stars, but we didn't always know that. Um, around the turn of the century, people looked at images like this one, uh, which shows a cluster of actually a thousand galaxies called the Coma Cluster. And they saw that in contrast to the surrounding stars, galaxies were uh, fuzzy, uh, they were extended, whereas park stars looked like little light points, and they were different colors. And astronomers referred to them as nebulae, the word uh, comes from the Latin for fog or mist, so they were like these little blobs of mist. And it was some time before astronomers realized, about in the, around the turn of the century, as I mentioned, that galaxies uh, were really very large collections of stars. And one of the people who did pioneering work in this area was uh, this fellow named Fritz Zwicky, who was an astronomer at, at Caltech. Here's an image of a thousand galaxies and stars, and I'd like you to take a few minutes to look at this image and try to look at objects, each object, uh, and decide whether you think it's a star or a galaxy. Knowing what you know that a galaxy is a collection of stars, how does a galaxy in this picture look different than a picture of stars, of a star? Uh, so let's take uh, four minutes and uh, go ahead and do that. All right, welcome back. Uh, I hope you learned some things looking at the image. Uh, this is a, a close-up of the nearest galaxy to Earth, the uh, Andromeda galaxy, which is called M31. It's about two and a half light years away. Uh, I'm sorry, two and a half million light years away. So the light that we see in the Hubble Space Telescope that took this image took uh, about two and a half million years to get to Earth. This uh, galaxy is a little bit bigger than the Milky Way and has about a trillion stars in it. So it weighs about a trillion times, uh, the stars weigh about a trillion times uh, the mass of our sun. And even in this picture, which is the very uh, best picture you can get from the Hubble Space Telescope, which is the very best telescope there is, you can't really see individual stars uh, inside of the galaxy. What you can see is a very broad, bright region here, and then a more diffuse region outside. And that's really uh, mostly stars and some gas clouds. So what makes a galaxy have this shape? Well, it's all about gravity. And the matter in the center of the galaxy is exerting a gravitational force on stars on the outside of the galaxy. And they're orbiting around the galaxy like this. Now, the stars, for example, halfway out, are moving at some velocity of about 300 kilometers per second. But this galaxy is so huge, it's going to take them 200 million years to go all the way around once. So in the time scale that we're be we've been making observations, these stars haven't moved at all. And so if you want to study the way stars move within a galaxy, we have to use a different method. So here's a picture of a galaxy looking at the top. We'll just approximate it as a circle, with, which is a collection of stars. As I said, about a trillion stars. And the stars are orbiting around the center. 
And the question is what causes them to orbit? Here is a star and it's in circular motion just like a planet in our, in our solar system. So as you've learned, if this is our solar system and here's the sun and here's the earth here, the earth has some velocity, our orbital velocity in this direction, which is um, about a few thousand miles per hour. And the thing that's keeping the earth orbiting around the sun is a gravitational force that's pulling the earth towards the sun along this direction. So the force only acts along the line connecting the earth and sun and then the velocity swings the earth around keeping this distance constant just like a ball on a string. In the next demo you have a ball on a string and swing it around your head and let it go. The string is providing a force like gravity and when you let it go the ball just goes flying off. So try this and take a few minutes discussing the role of string, the string, gravity, and why the ball goes straight when you let it go. So if we come back, now that you understand a little bit about how force makes something move in a circle, here's our star, and it's moving like this at some radius from the center of gal the galaxy. And one thing you've probably learned in uh, your elementary physics studies is that if we look at this star, it's got a centripetal force acting on it. And that's equal to the mass of the star times its velocity squared divided by the distance from the center of attraction. Newton's gravitational law says that the force acting on the star from gravity in order to make it move at this radius at this velocity is equal to a constant which is called g or Newton's constant. The mass inside of the radius which is the mass of the galaxy inside that region times the mass of the star divided by the radius squared. This must be equal to this because the centripetal force is balanced by the gravitational force and so we can set these two things equal to each other and what we see is that we have an m, the mass of the star on both sides so that cancels out. And we have an r squared and an r on both sides, so those cancel out. So that we can show that the mass inside of a given radius is equal to the velocity of the star moving at that radius times the radius divided by Newton's constant. So this tells us something very important about observation, which is if we can measure the velocity and radius of a star inside of a galaxy, we can measure the total mass of the galaxy inside of that radius. Here's a little demo using the ball and string again. The force you exert on the spring to make the ball go around is like gravity. Swing the ball around ten times slowly, paying attention to how much force you need to exert on the string. Now swing the ball around very fast. How does the force you exert change? 
In gravity, the force is related to the mass of the galaxy. So the greater the velocity of the star, the more mass there is inside the orbit of the star. This we showed in the relation m equals v squared times r divided by g. In this case, r is the same because the length of the string doesn't change. So v goes up means that the force you exert is much greater. So what we've shown through the demonstration and the equation is that you can relate the mass inside of the radius of a star with the velocity at which that star is moving. So if you can measure the velocities of stars within a galaxy, then you can determine what the mass of stars uh, at a given radius are and compare that with the amount of light you see. That measurement was first undertaken in the 1970s by the astronomer Vera Rubin, who observed the Andromeda galaxy, which is shown here. This is the one we looked at before. And she was able to make use of the Doppler shift of light from a moving object in order to determine its velocity. Now, the Doppler shift is a phenomenon that works with any wave, light or sound, which, causes, which is the result of a moving source squishing the wave and making it appear at a high frequency if the source is moving towards you, or a lower frequency if the source is moving away. You might have studied this already in your physics course. Uh, if you have, uh, let's take a few minutes to review it. Uh, if not, let's take a few minutes for your instructor to explain it to you um, briefly at the blackboard. So now that you understand a little bit about how you can use the color of the star to determine its velocity, we can see what Vera Rubin has done. Here's a graph superimposed on top of the galaxy with her velocity measurements uh, as a function of radius. She did this by just focusing her telescope at different points in the radius, along the radius of Andromeda and measuring the color of the star, which as we've just seen tells you the velocity. What you can see is the velocity changes a lot in the center of the galaxy and then becomes constant as you go out further to further larger radii. Remember that the mass inside of a radius is equal to the velocity of squared times the radius divided by Newton's constant. And r is increasing as you go further out. Vera Rubin's data says the velocity is constant so the amount of mass inside the radius must be going up because V is constant and R is going up. What you can see if you look at the image of Andromeda is that the number of stars or the amount of visible matter is decreasing as you move out in radius because the image is dimmer. This means that in order to explain this data, which is called the rotation curve, there has to be some component of the mass that isn't visible that isn't emitting light, and that's called dark matter. So once Vera Rubin had measured the mass inside of a given radius of M31, the next step was to find out what mass you would predict from the number of stars inside of that radius. So what was done is people observed nearby stars, the captain stars, and measured the total light output inside of, of the star and since the star was nearby by observing its motion inside of our galaxy one could measure the mass of the star and I'll put little stars on so this could be done with our sun or some nearby stars called the captain stars. Then, in order to compare with what was measured using the rotation curve, one could take the light of M31 inside of the same radius as this mass was measured and then multiply by this ratio. And this 
is another way of measuring the mass of M31, but this is from light. And this is from velocity. It turns out that this mass is something like 10 times this mass. And that tells us that there must be a significant amount of mass inside of M31 that isn't stars, that isn't emitting light, but that is in fact dark matter. After Rubin's measurement in 1972, many people thought that the dark matter inside of the galaxy could be uh, planets, large dust clouds, failed stars, things like that. But measurements of uh, the relic particles from the Big Bang that were made in the 1980s and 1990s systematically excluded all of those things. And now we're left with only really one possibility, which is that dark matter is some kind, new kind of particle, uh, which could be either very light or very heavy, but it's no kind of particle we've ever seen here on Earth before, and we call it a WIMP, a weakly interacting massive particle. So here's a question for you to discuss. What else could this matter be? We've shown this two different ways now, and the question is, what do you think it could be? So one idea for WIMPs is that they are some weakly interacting massive particle. Weakly interacting means they don't interact much with normal matter. So they're called WIMPs. What does it mean to not interact much with normal matter? Well, if we take the matter we know about, the particle that interacts the least is called the neutrino. The neutrino was originally postulated by Enrico Fermi in the 1930s and first observed in 1956 by Rhinus and Cowan. A neutrino interacts so little that if you wanted a neutrino to interact, you would have to line up 200 Earths. So here's your neutrino, and then you take 200 copies of the Earth One, two, three, two hundred. And if you sent this neutrino in, you could be guaranteed that it would interact, it would hit another particle somewhere in here. A WIMP has an interaction strength that is at most the strength of the neutrino interaction divided by 10 million. Now, neutrinos are notoriously difficult to detect, and people have spent their careers trying to detect them in various ways. They usually de require detectors at accelerators that weigh tens or hundreds or even thousands of tons, and even with detectors that big, only a few neutrinos interact each day. Here is something that interacts 10 million times less, and that makes dark matter very difficult to find. So the mass of a dark matter particle, our best guess is they weigh between 100 and 1,000 times as much as a proton. And you know a proton is about the simplest nucleus we can, we can have. And their density inside of the galaxy is about one particle per thousand cubic centimeters, or about one particle per liter. And they're moving at a velocity of one thousandth the speed of light, which is three, um, hundred thousand meters per second. 
This seems pretty fast, but actually by particle physics standards, this is very slow. This is not many particles to work with. This is pretty heavy. So the best way to detect such a particle is to look for it hitting a normal nucleus here on Earth and giving it some energy. So here's a normal nucleus, and the dark matter particle is going to hit it and go off in some direction. And then this nucleus is going to recoil with some energy, and our job is to detect that energy. Dark matter particles can hit an atomic nucleus just like these two tennis balls. The stationary ball is the atomic nucleus, and it gets some energy from being hit by the moving tennis ball, which represents the dark matter particle. So now we have some idea of one way of detecting dark matter, and so a question for you to talk about among yourselves is, can you think of other ways that you might detect dark matter? In this clip, Ezekiel rolls 10 tennis balls at a time at a golf ball. Most of the time, the golf ball does not get hit. The tennis balls are like the dark matter particles, and the golf ball is like a nucleus. The space between the nuclei is very great in comparison with its size, even in a solid, so the dark matter particles do not often hit a nucleus here on Earth. Here's the hallway that you just saw in the video. And that hallway is three meters or 300 centimeters across. And the golf ball, which measures about two centimeters across, is sitting at rest here. And then from all different directions, We rolled tennis balls down the hallway towards the golf ball. And those tennis balls are um, 10 centimeters across. OK, now what has to happen for one of these tennis balls to hit the golf ball? Well, if the golf ball is here and the tennis ball comes by on this side, the outer radius or outer edge of this tennis ball has to be at least where the outer edge of the golf ball is. And so if this distance is 5 centimeters and this distance is 1 centimeter, then on this side, the tennis ball must pass within 6 centimeters of the golf ball. And similarly, on this side, so that's a total of 12 centimeters. So the probability of hitting is 12 centimeters. They're all within this 300 centimeter interval. So then the problem of, of hitting, probability of hitting is 12 centimeters divided by uh, 300 centimeters. Uh, which is 0 0.04 or 1 in 25. So in the video you just saw, we rolled 10 tennis balls five times. Uh, I think you saw that one of them struck uh, the golf ball, so you should work out the probability. Now, this is on average, so sometimes there will be more or fewer collisions than you would predict from here. 
And if you do it a large number of times, then it will converge to this, this value. But this gives a relationship between the probability of an interaction, or hitting, and the sizes of the objects. And obviously, the smaller you make the objects, the lower the probability uh, of an interaction. And that's what we're, we're really getting at with this little demonstration. The dark matter particles are small, so they don't interact very much. So what we've learned is that you can look for dark matter hitting uh, a nucleus here on Earth and uh, use that as evidence for dark matter. And in our lab here at MIT, we've, we've built a detector to do this. And uh, you've just seen a video about that detector. And here are some images from the detector. Instead of dark matter, we use neutrons, which is a particle that's like a dark matter particle whose property we, we know very well. And what you see here are images of a fluorine gas nucleus recoiling after being struck by a neutron. The neutrons always come from the left side of the image, so you can see the recoil always happens away from the direction of neutrons. And we can use this phenomenon in order to look for dark matter uh, in our galaxy. Now, the problem is that there's not very much uh, dark matter. Uh, we worked out before that there's about one dark matter particle per quart of, of volume, or per liter of volume. And we've also worked out that the interaction strength of dark matter isn't very strong. So that means we need to build a very large detector and wait a very long time uh, in order to de detect dark matter. So we're just at the beginning of a long road of an experiment. So to summarize what we've uh, discussed in this segment in the last hour, You've learned that a galaxy is a collection of stars, that the gravitation between the stars holds the galaxy together, but there aren't enough stars that we can see that to account for the total amount of dark matter inside of the in, total amount of matter inside of the galaxy. We call this stuff dark matter, and it's really not related to any known particle here on Earth, and we look for it by its interaction with normal matter. The problem is it doesn't interact with normal matter very much, and that makes the experiments very, very difficult. So I hope you've learned a little bit of physics and a little bit of astronomy and a little bit about what I do, and uh, good luck with the rest of your study in physics. Uh, hello, I'm Peter Fisher. I'm the uh, instigator of this Blossoms video on galaxies and dark matter. And uh, this is the teacher's uh, aid, or teacher's materials. Um, and here I will expand on uh, the questions that are given in the demonstrations and try to include some uh, additional material that may be helpful in uh, presenting this topic. Uh, the topic of uh, dark matter and galaxies is a relatively uh, straightforward one and relies really only on uh, a knowledge of um, elementary kinematics uh, and Newton's laws. Uh, however, uh, I have included a derivation of uh, the centripetal force, uh, which uh, is something that many students learn, but um, perhaps uh, I've included a der derivation in these materials so that um, the instructor can go through it with the students again, uh, if need be. Um, all of the demonstrations are, uh, in some sense, optional. I think there's value to doing them, but I do realize that it may be difficult because of uh, time or space constraints. Uh, so the demonstrations are included in the video, and uh, they can simply be used instead of uh, actually uh, doing them uh, 
uh, yourselves or having the students do them. Uh, so I will discuss the, the questions and out of the relevant materials uh, point by point uh, as we go through this. So we introduced the idea of galaxies as uh, the first part of uh, this module. And we don't really assume any prior knowledge of uh, what a gal galaxy is. Um, the first question, uh, which is talk to each other about the differences between galaxies and stars, how might these differences show, show up in an image? Look at the image of the coma cluster carefully. For each object, decide whether it's a galaxy or a star. The idea of this first question is to get students to look at the image and realize that there are really kind of two kinds of objects uh, in that image of the coma cluster. Uh, one object is uh, nearby stars, uh, which are typically within a few hundred thousand light years, and the other are galaxies, which are um, uh, millions of light years away uh, or more. And really the only goal of this uh, module, or this, this first question, is to get the students thinking about the two different classes of image and how it may have been very difficult in the, in the very beginning of astronomy, uh, up until the 1900s really, for astronomers to bring themselves to realize that the big, fuzzy, uh, oddly shaped, uh, yellowish or reddish objects are actually very large collections of stars at uh, very, very large distances. Um, the stars, uh, which are primarily from our Milky Way, are, are point-like or, or like a, a little disk. Uh, they're circular. Uh, they're typically blue uh, in color. So really all that uh, we're after here is for the students to put them to, to begin to be astronomers and try to classify the objects uh, in that image. The students should talk about each question for four or five minutes, or you know, as as you as the instructor feel. But I think four or five minutes is is a good start, and it's really best to have the the students discuss uh, with each other if that's appropriate, um, because that way they're they're learning from each other um, um, and and beginning a dialogue. And scientific investigation is inherently collaborative, so. When they learn to do this, they're, they're actually learning how to do science. Um, in the second part, we begin to discuss how a particular star is, is held inside of a galaxy. And uh, the first uh, demonstration of the module is uh, simply um, a ball on a string. And uh, my student, uh, Ezekiel, uh, just uh, whirls the ball around and, and lets it go. And there are really two things that are being demonstrated here. Uh, the first one is that as he is uh, holding the ball on the end of the string, uh, the force acting uh, on this, by this, of the string acting on the ball is what's keeping the ball in a, a circular motion. Um, in this case, the string is analogous to gravity. And uh, in the same way gravity keeps the uh, uh, object orbiting around the center of the, the galaxy. When Ezekiel lets go of the, the, the string, just like removing the force, the ball flies off uh, in uh, a linear way, in a straight line. Now, of course, the Earth's gravity eventually pulls the ball back to the ground, but the, the thing the students should observe is that once the string's force is removed, the ball wants to go in a, in a straight line. Uh, this is uh, one of Newton's laws, which says that an object uh, in rectilinear motion remains in rectilinear motion unless acted upon by an outside force. So what we'd like to do with question two, which is swing the ball around on the end of a string and let it go, why does the ball move the way it does, in what way does the string play the role of gravity, uh, is we'd like the students to begin uh, to have the discussion of the, the relationship between gravity and the circular motion and Newton's first law. Um, as far as the demonstration goes, uh, we've included the demonstration on the, on the video uh, and you can simply work from that. Uh, you can make your own. Uh, all you really need is a, 
uh, string and you know any sort of, of object that, that isn't too terribly heavy, um, but you know it's a small uh, children's toy or uh, a car key or uh, anything that's got enough that weighs more than the string that you can whirl around and, and let go uh, either in your classroom or outside and, and not have it do any damage works just fine. Uh, ideally, the students themselves would, would each make one of these uh, if you have the means and, um, and have the time and uh, do the demonstration themselves because there is really value to uh, as the ball is being, or the object is being swung around, feeling the force on the string that, that you are making it go, and then when you let go, feeling that force disappear and seeing the thing fly off uh, in a straight line. But uh, any, any way will uh, be just fine. Now in this third part, we try to become um, a little more quantitative uh, in using the relationship between uh, the mass of the galaxy and the force acting on the particle to keep it in a circular orbit. Uh, and to do this, we bring in the idea of uh, centripetal acceleration and then relate the centripetal acceleration, which is the force necessary to make the ball go into a circle, to uh, the gravitational force, which is the interaction that Isaac Newton uh, first postulated for the interaction, gravitational interaction between two masses. Um, I, let me show you on the blackboard uh, where the centrifugal force, uh, centripetal force comes from, and um, then we'll, we'll come back to the question. Uh, so this is a short discussion of uh, centripetal acceleration. Uh, it's something that, that many students have had. Um, perhaps it's just been stated. Um, so this is to give a little more background uh, to it. So what we're thinking about is here's some gravitating body and we're thinking about a star for example that is making a circular orbit at some distance r around that object so the star is just going around in a circle at a fixed radius now we know from observation and uh, kinematics that in circular orbit the velocity is constant. Now the velocity is changing at, at this time the velocity points in this direction and let's think about a time a little bit while later at t the velocity is pointing in this direction so that's v at say t equals zero and this is v at t equals time t the magnitudes of the two velocities are the same, but their directions are different. So if in this time t, this star has gone from here to here, the angle that it makes with respect to its starting point, theta, is just equal to this distance, which is the constant velocity t, or constant velocity, times t divided by the radius r. That's just saying that uh, the angle subtended by an arc of a circle is equal to the length of the arc divided by the radius of the circle. Okay, now if we look at how the velocity has changed. Here's velocity at t equals zero, which is just this vector. The velocity at t equals t is a vector of the same length, but pointing in a different direction. So the velocity has changed only in direction. The change in direction by similar triangles is this angle theta. So this distance 
is equal to the magnitude of these sides, which are the same, times theta. So that's V times theta. So the change in velocity is equal to V times theta. And that happens in a time t. And the change in velocity in time t is just equal to the acceleration. So now we can say that the acceleration is equal to v divided by t times theta, which is equal to v times t divided by r. These two cancel out. And what we're left with is that the acceleration is v squared divided by r. This is called the centripetal acceleration. And it's kinematic in the sense that if an object goes with velocity v in a circle at radius r, then this is the acceleration. It doesn't tell you how the why the acceleration is that, that comes from Newton's force law, which we discussed in the, in the Blossom video. This just tells you that for circular, circular motion at constant velocity, what the acceleration has to be. Um, question three reads, if you swing a ball on a string, the faster you swing the ball, the more force you must exert. Try timing how long it takes you to swing a ball around 10 times at different speeds and see if you can feel the force difference. If the force you exert on the spring, string represents gravity and the gravitational force is proportional to the mass inside the orbit radius, what does this tell you about the relationship between the mass inside the orbit radius and velocity? This uh, is trying to, in a physical way, uh, establish the relationship that is shown uh, between mass, velocity, and orbit radius uh, just before the third question on the, the Blossom's video. Um, again, I think there's a lot of value in the students actually feel, feeling the force on the string increasing considerably when they try to swing the ball around 10 times very fast as opposed to 10 times very slow. But really using either the video, uh, a demonstration by the in-course instructor are both just fine and the uh, materials are exactly the same as uh, for the previous uh, demonstration. Um, I've given you just a minute ago a uh, little derivation of the centripetal force. Uh, that's kinematic in nature, uh, meaning it's a relationship between how an object moves and the force. Um, there's really nothing more to it than I, I've shown you. Uh, in the video, we relate that to uh, the Newtonian force between two objects. Um, which of course was worked by, out by Isaac Newton, and then later uh, Albert Einstein uh, created the general theory of relativity that put this on much further, firmer ground. Um, that is, is something I think uh, you can only just state. Um, the First, the law, which is the force is equal to the Newtonian's constant times the product of the two masses divided by the radius squared and the fact that the force is directed along the line between the two objects. Um, also, the, the mass, uh, there are two masses involved, the mass of the orbiting star and then the, the mass enclosed by the star's orbit. The fact that you can treat that mass enclosed by the orbit uh, as a single quantity uh, actually comes from Gauss's law, uh, which is a unique law to 1 over r squared forces. Uh, deriving why that is always true for any force that's 1 over r squared is, is beyond the scope of this um, video because it involves vector calculus. Uh, but it might be something uh, to talk about and emphasize as I go through it in the video uh, really rather quickly. So the second part uh, really just gets them to think through the two algebraic steps uh, right before this question is asked that ends with the relationship between uh, the mass inside the orbit radius, the velocity, 
the orbit radius, a Newton's constant. Uh, the algebra is very simple, but uh, the consequence is profound. And it's this relationship that really led uh, Fritz Zwicky to uh, come up with the idea of um, dark matter and then uh, is behind Vera Rubin's measurement of Andromeda. Uh, in the actual implementation of these measurements, there's uh, considerably more advanced mechanics, most of it quite elementary. But uh, I think this relationship really captures the essence uh, at a way that's comprehensible for secondary school students. Vera Rubin's velocity measurements were done using Doppler shift, and this is discussed in uh, this section of the, the video. Uh, Doppler shift is, is one of the most interesting wave phenomena, and I'd like to take uh, a few minutes to derive it uh, using secondary school level wave mechanics. So um, here's a little derivation of the phenomenon of, of redshift or blue shift, which is the change in frequency or wavelength of light or color of light due to the motion of the emitter. Uh, so if we have a star here that's at rest and we sit here on Earth and observe the star with a, a telescope, the star emits light, which is an electromagnetic wave. And the electromagnetic wave has a wavelength, which we call lambda. And it has a period, or frequency, which is the time difference between repetitions of the periodic wave, which is t, or the period. And so the frequency is equal to 1 over the period. And also the velocity of, of the wave, so V wave, which we call C, is equal to the wavelength times the frequency, and that's equal to the wavelength divided by the period, just using that relationship between period and frequency. So for here, what happens is the light is emitted at some time t equals zero. And then at some later time, this wave is observed here. This could, for example, could be a telescope. The light is collected by the telescope. And the color of the light is determined by the spacing or wavelength between the peaks and the electromagnetic wave. And that determines the color that an observer at the telescope uh, will see for that light. So this is all fine. This distance and this distance are the same if uh, the object is at rest. What happens if the object is, for example, moving uh, towards the Earth? So here is the case where the star moves towards the Earth with some velocity that we'll call v. Um, And at t equals 0, let's say there's the wave coming out. And at t equals 0, that peak in the periodic electromagnetic wave is emitted and begins to move towards the observer down here. OK? So that wave is now moving. And at a time, t equal capital T, or one period later, the star has moved a distance equal to V times T, capital T. That's just simple kinematics. So now the star is here. This peak has moved a distance equal to the velocity of the light wave times capital T. That's just the motion of an electromagnetic wave. And then at this time, so that's this peak is here now. And after time t, this way, this star is emitting the next peak in the electromagnetic wave. So what we want to calculate is this distance. 
this distance is going to be this distance, which is C times capital T, minus this distance, which is V times T, capital T. And that's equal to capital T times C minus V. And that's equal to the wavelength the ratio of the wavelength from the moving star with this wavelength from the star that's not moving, that's T minus C minus V, and then from the relationship I had before, this is C times T. Let me just put that again. Remember, frequency times period is equal to the velocity and the period is equal to 1 over time. That's equal to the velocity. So lambda, the wavelength, is equal to the velocity divided by the period. So these two things cancel. And what remains is 1 minus V divided by C. That tells you the relationship between the wavelength that an observer at the telescope sees to the wavelength at the emission point of the star is less than one. Now, if V is very small, for example, 200 kilometers per second, and C is something like 300 3,000 kilometers per second, then this ratio is less than 10%. So the change in color is not terribly large, but nonetheless an observable, observable effect. Now, the wavelength being shorter means that the light appears bluer. And that happens when V is positive, meaning the star is moving towards the Earth. If the star is moving away from the Earth, V is negative, so this quantity is greater than 1, which means the wavelength is longer, and that means the light appears redder, hence the term redshift. There are several places that this is written up in more detail, and uh, I'll post them on the website. Uh, the derivation I've shown you is, is self-contained, and if your students have had some exposure to waves, uh, and know about frequency and wavelength um, and in a, in, a, in a formal way uh, would be perfectly appropriate for them to um, work through themselves or for you to give them a, a short lecture on. Alternatively, you can simply state the result and use the qualitative argument about um, a car or a, a siren having a, a higher print pitch when the, the car or siren is moving towards you in a lower pitch than when it's moving away, and then relating sound as a wave light phenomenon to light as a wave light uh, phenomenon. Um, they will have had some experience uh, with this most likely, and um, this is a, a useful place for them to begin to understand the, the very important phenomenon of Doppler shift. In question four, uh, what do you think other what what other ways can you think of to explain Vera Rubin's observations is kind of an open-ended uh, question at this point uh, for the students to try to talk about what other forms of matter uh, might be inside of a galaxy that uh, isn't emitting light. Um, this can be uh, dust, it can be plasma, it can be planets or comets uh, or any number of a uh, large number of things, black holes. Uh, that, that don't emit, not lights, and this is kind of just an open-ended place to talk about what else might be in a galaxy. Uh, clearly, when we observe galaxies, what we're observing are, are stars, uh, which emit light. But inside our own galaxy, uh, inside our solar system, uh, we um, see many, many other things, asteroids, comets, planets, planetary rings, uh, there's incredible evidence of a black hole that's quite large at the center of our galaxy. So this is just a place for students to, to go back and think about what the, this very complex, uh, rich 
uh, object that they've just learned about uh, really contains. Um, question number five, can you think of other ways of detecting dark matter particles, uh, is kind of an open-ended uh, discussion. Uh, the, the students have learned um, now that there could be these particles uh, that are flying around and uh, these particles bump into things, um, presumably atomic nuclei, and that's the way we've discussed detecting them uh, in this video. Um, now is the time for them to perhaps think of what other things could particles that are whizzing around uh, do. Um, is there some way that they can be collected? Is there some way uh, that other particles can be bounced off of them? Um, the answer in, in these cases is really no, uh, and this comes up in the next uh, demonstration and derivation in the video. Uh, the fact is that in order uh, to be consistent with our observations, uh, dark matter particles must be very, very small, much smaller than nuclei, um, perhaps even much smaller than electrons. And uh, this means that they don't interact with ordinary matter much. Uh, so if you made a bottle out of some normal matter, steel for example, and were able to collect dark matter and put it into the bottle, uh, the dark matter would just fall out. So this is uh, where we have uh, a discussion about what it means for subatomic interactions to happen and that they have relative strengths and that some particles can be very, very penetrating. Um, and that's in distinction to most of the things around us that are, you know, a, a, a wood desktop or, or air or, or things that can be contained. Um, and because that, in order to contain something, you must have it interact with something. So the, the derivation of the probability for two objects uh, hitting each other, you may notice that I'm wearing different clothes than in the rest of the video. Uh, that's because uh, in viewing the first full cut, uh, Dick Larson and Elizabeth Murray noticed that I had left out a factor of two uh, in the derivation and I've had to reshoot it. Um, I really appreciate them pointing this out and uh, I'm a little bit embarrassed by it. Um, in any event, this is a straightforward mathematical calculation, um, and the, the word for the quantity which relates the probability of, of interaction of, of a target with incoming projectiles is cross-section. Um, the demonstration that you'll see in a minute and the derivation uh, are in one dimension, I'm sorry, in two dimensions. Um, in the real world, things move in three dimensions, so the cross-section represents an area. And it's essentially the size presented to an incoming object by a target object um, and has dimensions of area or, or length times length or length squared. Uh, the smaller the cross-section, the smaller the chances of a interaction occurring. And uh, the cross-section or size of an object is different depending on what kind of interaction there, there is. Uh, we're used to seeing things, so we associate, for example, the size of a table with the physical dimensions of the table we would measure with a ruler. Um, that's the size of the table for electromagnetic interactions because when we look at something, what we're doing is we're de detecting light, and that's electromagnetic. If you were able to measure the size of the table using neutrinos, it would be much, much smaller than the size of the table you would measure using uh, light. Uh, and that's simply because the neutrinos interact mu much less, and uh, consequently the table appears much smaller to a beam of neutrinos of comparable size to a beam of light. This is kind of the, the basic idea uh, behind the smallness of the dark matter interaction is that the dark matter particles uh, only interact via a very weak interaction and consequently their size is small and that's what makes them very difficult to detect because they only interact very infrequently. Uh, question six is how many total tennis balls did you throw? How many hit the target golf ball? 
Can you find the probability of hitting from the dimensions of the two balls and compare with your experiment? Um, there's nothing magic about using a tennis ball or a golf ball. It's you know what Ezekiel happened to have in his backpack. Um, you can use marbles. Uh, you can use uh, baseballs, softballs, soccer balls, basketballs. Uh, it's good if one of the balls has a different size and you use that as the target. Uh, but if if that's not possible, then using balls that are all the same size. Uh, question six asks really that you do uh, the calculation that I was that was just done. Um, if it's more convenient, uh, you can simply use the video uh, where Ezekiel throws 10 tennis balls uh, five times and you can see that there is only one uh, interaction. Uh, so that's 1 50th and that's consistent with the uh, derivation that's given in the demo. Again, this is uh, something where the students can have a lot of fun and spend you know, 10 or 15 minutes rolling balls down the hallway, uh, but it may not be possible or appropriate in some places, and so uh, please use the video uh, in, in lieu of an in-course demonstration. Um, in the last segment where I talk about the dark matter um, detector we have, uh, there is mention of a video that actually refers to the tennis ball rolling uh, video about uh, how the two-body interaction uh, works. Um, I didn't include any large questions uh, at the end. Um, questions uh, you might want to discuss uh, with the students uh, is, is kind of really recapping uh, what they've learned, which is a lot. This is quite a, a few topics to cover in a one-hour uh, session, but um, what the difference between a galaxy and a star is, and how galaxies are collections of stars and, and possibly other things. How the gravitational force uh, keeps the collection of stars together uh, and the, makes the stars move at a certain velocity, and by measuring this velocity you can learn something about how mass is distributed uh, within the galaxy. Um, using the relationship between uh, light and mass uh, derived from the sun or from nearby stars to determine uh, in another way how much mass is in the galaxy leads to a problem that there is more matter when you look at the gravitational dynamics than uh, when you just use the light and how that has led to the dark matter problem. Uh, the idea that dark matter could be particles that don't interact very much and what it means to not interact very much via the simple example uh, with the cross-section. Uh, the website will have uh, some additional materials uh, posted on it uh, and please feel free to contact me directly if you have any questions. Uh, I have to say it's been a pleasure doing this and uh, I hope uh, you and your students uh, get something useful out of this. Thank you very much.